there is no better time to visit a rain garden than when it is actually raining. So today is a perfect day to be visiting this installation that about a week ago I had worked on with Sean James. He gave me a little interview that covered the basics of a rain garden, some tips and tricks for installing your own, as well as cutting the cost of installation, the benefits for both your own property and the environment of a rain garden, and a whole lot of other information that we're gonna be covering in this video. Now this project was a really exciting collaborative effort between Credit Valley Conservation, Sean James, who was in charge of the design and the overseeing of the installation, a number of volunteers like myself, but also a lot of suppliers in the industry. So this really brought the community together during the installation, but also ongoing because this now is an educational space for the community to learn more about the ecological benefits of a rain garden. And it causes a lot of people to stop and ask questions because this is isn't your typical garden. This isn't what people are used to seeing in a space. So let's dive into what Sean had to say about rain gardens and how you can make use of that information. There's this warm water and it's often salty water that runs off our rooftops and our driveways, runs directly into the creek and, and destroys the, the habitat for the nesting of the fish where they lay their eggs and all the other things that live in the river as well. There's a creek locally that's so salty that uh, salt water blue crabs are living in it. We can do a lot to stop that and plants are really, really, really good at what we call bioremediation, about taking uh, chemicals out of the water and, and taking them out of the system. Plants are brilliant at that. So, you know, it's, it's yet another good thing that you're doing by gardening in general, but by rain gardening specifically. I'm Sean James and I'm with Sean James Consulting and Design and we're working with the folks at St. Albans Church and Credit Valley Conservation to create a couple of really nifty rain gardens. And uh, before I go through the plan, not everybody knows what a rain garden is. Rain gardens are designed, they're sort of dish shaped gardens designed to take water from the downspout and hold it and soak it into the ground. And then we use a lot of really cool native plants, beautiful things that are often good for birds and pollinators. Uh, and, and we design it in a way that's hopefully beautiful. Uh, things that have good texture and flowers on and off all year and even good winter interest. When you're designing any garden, if it's goal related, you don't have to give up beauty. You just design with the same principles. So we're lucky here. We've got two downspouts, uh, one over here and one on this corner. Uh, we've got really sandy soil, so it drains super, super well. And we're gonna transit the water through a, a river rock swale into this large rain garden here. And then this downspout is gonna come into a large rain garden here. There's gonna be a stone bridge, uh, which is really cool, so that the water will travel under. So if this rain garden fills faster than the other and so on, it'll hold it. Um, and there are two cardinal rules with rain gardens. One is that you want to get the water two meters at least from the foundation before you start soaking it into the ground. So we'll use pond liner and then cover it with river rock to get the water two meters away. And the other rule is that it has to drain away within 24 to 48 hours. So normally you'd want to do an infiltration test, but we have such good sandy soil here, like it's a sandy loam, that we don't have to worry about that so much. So we have a plan. Um, and that dictates all the different plants that are going to be used, everything from blue flag iris to sedge grasses to our native deciduous holly uh, called sparkleberry or winterberry, which is way less cool a name, uh, potentilla. A lot of people don't know Potentilla is native. Uh, the poorly named Sneezeweed, which doesn't cause any issues uh, as far as allergies go. And Goldenrod, same deal. We're using Fireworks Goldenrod. Uh, and I'm, I'm always in the process of trying new things in landscapes. We're going to be using um, Marsh Mallow or Swamp Mallow, which is a native and rare plant. Uh, and I like layering plants as well. So um, where there are grasses or sneezeweed, because it's slow to come up, we'll plant marsh marigold in around it. So it'll come up in the spring, do its thing, and then if it gets too dry, it goes dormant, and then the sneezeweed takes over and blooms late in the summer. So you get more bang for your buck space-wise. One of the neat plants that we're using here is uh, an evergreen native holly called inkberry holly. And there's so many problems with boxwood now that inkberry holly is an excellent alternative to boxwood. It looks 
just like boxwood, although maybe a bit bolder, and you can even use it for hedging. It won't look like much when we're done. Today we're just doing the sculpting. Uh, later in the week we're doing the plantings. And you gotta remember, with, with, especially with native plants, they sleep, they creep, then they leap. The first year what you see is what you get. The second year you get a little bit of growth, and the third year they take off. Um, so you gotta be a little bit patient with it. And if memory serves, we're gonna have signage here too. Even if it's your own garden, if it is near a sidewalk or something, I always try and get people to put in a sign saying, this is milkweed and this is what it does. These are native plants. Because people don't know what they can do. I think you can fix all the problems in the world with landscaping, whether you're doing um, edible planting or native planting or habitat creation, uh, all of it should be involved with stewarding the soil, uh, nutrient recycling, what falls on a property stays on a property, so you sequester carbon that way. Uh, I, I think horticulturists deserve capes, whether you're a professional or a, a homeowner. Uh, I, I really think that we need to be more, we need to feel better about what we do, and, and gardening is a great way to do it. In new communities, we talk about urban soil. In old communities or where um, the soil has had time to adapt or in nature, we talk about natural soil. And this soil is a really, see if, if you take a mitt full of it and, crum and hold it and it just falls apart in your hands, that's a, this is a good sandy loam. This is gold as far as soil goes. This is as good as soil gets, in my opinion. So it's going to have really good drainage. It's got little pebbles and rocks in it, and that's okay because that adds to drainage too. It's important to know the soil where you are so that you can figure out what to plant. We used to spend a lot of time, energy, and money changing the soil to match the plant. I want to plant rhododendrons, so I'm going to add peat moss to my soil. Now we're learning to plant things like bee balm which likes clay soil if you're in a clay area. Uh, and there's all sorts of cool plants that grow in sandy soil, some awesome asters and sassafras uh, and black oak. You, you match the plant to the soil and your job is way easier in the long run. If you're looking at rain gardens, if you have clay soil, you probably only wanna make the garden between four and six inches deep. If you've got sandy soil, uh, if it's really free draining, you can go up to two feet uh, if it's draining you know, maybe uh, 50 millimeters an hour, but that's, that's very rare. That need, you need to be on a sand bend for that. Um, but generally speaking, I, I would make a rain garden about a foot deep, and that's what we're gonna do here. There's a lot of back and forth, shall we say, about whether to amend the soil. So when you dig a rain garden, do you dig it deeper and then add in soil uh, or mix that's 50% compost and 50% earth. And I'm not a fan of that because if it holds water for a while, let's say you get a few rain events day after day, then that organic matter starts to break down anaerobically, so you get the soil putrefying. Whereas, if you plant the plants that match the soil, we're back to that again, plant the plants that match the soil, uh, so in clay soil, no amendment, you just plant plants that stand clay, um, then they are tolerant of that level of flood, they're tolerant of that level of uh, uh, compaction, really. Well, clay soils are very tight, uh, and then they just get better and better over time. Uh, also, when the rain, when winter comes, rain gardens actually become more effective, you'd think not, because the water trickles into the soil and then freezes and <coughs> expands the soil, and it makes little capillaries for the water to go down into. Um, so that's, that's another interesting thing. When it comes to sculpting a rain garden, that's probably one of the most important things. So I tend to think less about digging and, and, and have in my mind the concept of sculpting. So I take a pick and we've got to remember that we're going to have river rock in here and the river rock takes up space. So instead of actually digging, I whittle, and I'm going to whittle it down as far as I need it, and then I'm going to deepen the center, and you can tell that we're in glacial till and that we're close to rockwood, because there are lots of rocks, but for the purposes of a rain garden, that's amazing, and you've got to make sure that you have positive drainage in the direction that you want, um, i.e., away from the building. You can have 
um, a rain garden on a slope. Uh, we did one for uh, Hamilton Conservation that um, was on a heavy duty slope. And, and if this were on more of an angle, you'd step it down and across and up and then down and across and up and down. So you create a series of rain gardens on the slope. For the job in, in Hamilton, we actually did switchbacks like a Swedish road and had it step down and down and down all the way around. But you gotta make berms in between those steps so that it holds the water and allows it to soak in. Otherwise, it just all rushes to the bottom. Every rain garden is gonna be different cost-wise. Um, it depends on the plants that you're choosing. It depends on uh, how, like disposal fees. I try and keep everything that's on a property on a property. So in this case, we're lucky there's a back 40. We're using the soil that we excavate from here to build a berm where there will be a future garden. We're taking the sod that we strip, putting it off to one corner and composting it. Uh, that's saving uh, a boatload of money. If you have to get rid of it, disposal is getting very expensive. Uh, a bin is $400, four to $600. Um, so there's a lot of variable costs. Um, and it depends on how tightly you're planting it, how patient you are, uh, and so on. I, I can't really give you a per square foot cost because everybody's different. Here, we're right by the road. Our tools are accessible. That makes a big difference. Um, and, uh, you know, how much river rock are you putting in? Uh, sidebar, you want to mulch ideally with hardwood mulch or shredded cedar. Uh, that's a better mulch to use. A lot of people are getting interested in rainwater and protecting our creeks and taking stress off infrastructure. Uh, so there's, there's massive interest growing right now. And I, I mean, I have a, a talk on my YouTube page. Uh, one of my whole rain garden talks is there. Uh, also Credit Valley Conservation has amazing resources. If you just search Google Credit Valley Conservation rain gardens, you'll get amazing stuff. If you searched LID, when the engineers get at things, words get complicated. Low impact development is the term for all the different features that you might use in rain gardens. So rain barrels, uh, infiltration trenches, which are sort of glorified French wells where it's all underground, um, and, and everything from stormwater ponds on up. Um, so that's, that's a good place to go as well. Toronto Region Conservation has some really good information as well. A friend of mine, um, Avesi, uh, Michael Albanese, has a book on rainwater gardens as well. Another interesting concept that counts under the sort of umbrella of low impact development, LID, is permeable paving. So if you're redoing your driveway or your back patio or whatever, there are all sorts of cool products like actual concrete pavers that have gaps in between them. So you'd put a base of clear gravel and then a little bit of what we call high performance base, small gravel, and then you interlock on top so that the rain flows in fills that area and then soaks into the ground. There's an, a newish product called Eco Raster, and it's uh, made in Canada with German engineering from recycled materials, 96 plastic bags go into each tile, and it's sort of a honeycomb pattern that you then fill with a pretty gravel, um, and you can plow it, you can drive on it, you can drive fire trucks on it. Um, and again, that anything that you can do to get rid of impermeable surfaces. Uh, you can't get rid of rooftops, but you can get rid of asphalt driveways when you replace them and patios when you replace them and then replace it with something that allows the water to soak in. And they don't always have to be visible. Uh, we did a project at Knox Church in Milton a few years ago, two giant downspouts on the front of the building. We dug a, a huge trench. It was about six feet across and three feet deep um, and maybe 10 feet long and we filled them up with something called aqua cubes which are sort of glorified milk crates uh, and then wrapped it in landscape fabric and then covered it over with a patio so like there's lots of different ways to hold the water on your property and soak it in and like i said that helps protect your neighborhood from flooding which is the number one insurance claim in canada now uh, overtaking fire and um, it helps protect our creeks
we're, we're affecting fish habitat because this warm water, and it's often salty water, that runs off our rooftops and our driveways, runs directly into the creek, and, and destroys the, the habitat for the nesting of the fish where they lay their eggs, and all the other things that live in the river as well. There's a creek locally that's so salty that uh, saltwater blue crabs are living in it. We can do a lot to stop that, and plants are really, really, really good at what we call bioremediation, about taking uh, chemicals out of the water and, and taking them out of the system. Plants are brilliant at that. So, you know, it's, it's yet another good thing that you're doing by gardening in general, but by rain gardening specifically. Just going a little further about keeping things on a property. Uh, I have a reasonably small 70 size lot um, built in the 70s. So I have a pile of sticks tucked behind some shrubs. Nobody walks into the garden and goes, what's with the pile of sticks? Um, and that creates something that we call a refugia pile. So a, a place for animals, good and bad, everybody to live in and then radiate out from there. And generally speaking, nature will balance herself out given half a chance. As long as we get out of the way, then nature will make the right balance of creatures in there. So you can get toads and ground beetles and so on, and they're gonna go eat the slugs and the snails in your garden. Um, but just, you know, find the place, tuck it behind some shrubs. Your garden's beautiful anyway. People are going to go, wow, this is lovely. Not look behind a pile of shrubs for some sticks. Leaves, I, I mulch and I put them right back on the bed in the spring. In the summertime, I might put them on my three bin composter. Like, it's pretty easy to keep stuff on the property, but maybe you do have to change your uh, perspective a little bit. If you're getting a tree taken down, um, try and keep a few of those big logs and put them along the back of the bed or put them at the front as a bench, or put them as a sculpture. And, and then as they slowly break down, then they become habitat again for all sorts of cool creatures, like robber flies. Robber flies look like someone glued a scorpion to a spider and gave it wings, but they're a great predator and they have to live in rotting wood for their, their larval stage. For more videos around gardening and nature and how you can use that to connect with your community, your family, and nature itself, make sure to hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for more videos.